Hi everyone, welcome back to Neurobiology at Providence College. I'm Joe DeGeorgis. Today we're going to talk about a Scientific American publication titled Chemical Signaling in the Brain by Jean-Pierre Chanjou. It turns out a few years back I had an office in the library of the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hall, and periodically I would take the elevator up to the second floor with this very nice French gentleman, and I didn't realize at the time, but it was Jean-Pierre. I recall that he had a big smile and a booming laugh. In this paper, Shang Zhu is talking about chemical signaling within the brain. And we've talked a little bit about this in this course so far. We've said that there are, of course, neurons within the brain, nerve cells, and they conduct electrical action potentials along the length of their axon, and they have terminal end of the cell here, which synapses with either downstream neurons or with muscle at the neuromuscular junction. And we said that when the electricity, the, elect the electrical signal, the action potential reaches the end of the cell, that it induces voltage sensitive calcium channels to open, calcium enters the presynaptic terminal and somehow induces the fusion of synaptic vesicles with the cell membrane and the release of neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters are the chemical signals that Shang Zhu is talking about. And now we know that there are many different neurotransmitters, 50 to 100 or more. A major question that Shang Zhu is trying to address is how does the neurotransmitter elicit its effect on this downstream cell, either muscle in this particular case or in other downstream neurons? And the idea is that there must be some type of receptor molecule that senses this neurotransmitter. A clue came from early work by Langley, who was studying the effects of curare and how this substance killed its victims. We've talked about curare before, and we said that it was a plant-based poison used by indigenous people to lace poison darts in hunting. It turns out the toxin kills its victims by asphyxiation, by somehow prohibiting motor neurons from causing muscles to contract in the diaphragm. The question of Langley was whether the toxin affected the neuron or affected the muscle. Langley knew that if you added the chemical nicotine to muscle, it would cause the muscle fiber to contract. So he did an experiment in which he first added curare, the toxin, and then added the nicotine, and it turns out that the curare inhibited nicotine's effect. The curare must be then acting on the muscle fiber rather than on the nerve cell. We now know that nicotine binds to a receptor on the surface of muscle that naturally binds the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So the neurotransmitter that's being released by the nerve cell is acetylcholine, but nicotine, when added experimentally, will have the same effect as the acetylcholine. That is, it'll cause this muscle fiber to contract. So nicotine and acetylcholine are agonists. They have the same effect. It turns out that the curare, the poison, binds to the same binding site on what we now refer to as the acetylcholine receptor and it binds tightly and it inhibits the effect of either nicotine or acetylcholine in these types of experiments. In the case of both a downstream muscle like we have here in the neuromuscular junction or a downstream neuron, the effect of the neurotransmitter is to cause ions to flow into the cell or out of the cell in some cases and cause a change in electrical action potential. The question was, 
how do these receptors do that? And what exactly are these receptor molecules? Experiments show that acetylcholine not only causes muscle to contract, but also causes electricity to flow in electric organs of electric fish. This electric organ contains billions of copies of the acetylcholine receptor and provided a good starting tissue to try to understand the structure and function of this molecule. So Sheng Zhu would like to try to biochemically purify acetylcholine receptors from the electric tissue of electric fish. And so he dissects out the piece of tissue like this, and then he homogenizes the sample. That is, he grinds it up and makes essentially an electric tissue milkshake. So you add some buffer, and then they have a plunger that fits tightly inside the test tube. It's called a down homogenizer. And you just push this plunger up and down through the piece of tissue, and you grind it up so that you have your milkshake. And of course, there's all sorts of pieces of the tissue and the individual cells and so on in this homogenate. Now it turns out that when you homogenize cells and the membrane, the cell membrane, so this is the lipid bilayer of the membrane, of course it's, you know, it's like a basketball. So you have the, the shell of the basketball is made out of the lipid bilayer and then the contents of the cell, which are in an aqueous environment, are make up the cytoplasm here and of course there's an aqueous environment on the outside of the cell and but if you break up these pieces of membrane in the process of homogenizing it the individual fragments of lipid come back together to form a smaller basketball because the lipid is hydrophobic so it naturally just comes back together and these are a, a byproduct of the homogenization and they just named them in the paper microsacs but it's a product of the biochemical purification that is the homogenization of the tissue now you can take so there are microsacs now of course in this homogenate and these are easily separated out over a test tube filled with different concentrations of sugar water. So you might have a 50% layer, 50% sugar in a buffer solution, Let's say a 20% layer, and then a 10% layer. And you can take your homogenate and add it to the top here. So it's floating at this point on top of the 10% layer. But now when you centrifuge under very high speed, 50%, 20%, 10% here, like this. Then the components separate out into these different layers based on their density. This is called a sucrose density gradient. So based on density. So you could have some materials from the homogenate in the pellet. You could have some floating here on top of the 50% layer in the 20% layer. And then some floating on top of the 10% layer, which would be the microsacs. So we have the microsacs here in this 10% layer. The microsacs are easy to purify because they're made of lipids, so they're relatively light. So they make it into the 10% layer, but they can't make it into the 20% layer or the 50% layer. And now we can simply take a needle, a syringe, and poke it through this glass tube and draw off the microsacs. So now we have purified microsacs, which are just fragments 
of the cell membranes from the electric cells of the electric tissue of electric fish. Now, if Langley was right that the receptors for acetylcholine are in the membrane, like this, the membrane of the cell, in this case the electric cells, that when you break these cells up through homogenization and you create the smaller microsacs, then the microsacs will contain the acetylcholine receptors. And we said that these are very easily biochemically purified by sucrose density gradient. And it turns out that Shangzhou did a really cool experiment because if you homogenize these cells in the presence of radioactive sodium, so we'll make a little asterisk here to say that they're hot, they're radioactive, and potassium, then when you break these up like this in the, in the homogenization step, so we have our plunger like this, and we have our tissue down here, and we add in these radioactive sodium and potassium ions like this. When we grind this piece of tissue up, then when the microsacs are formed, they end up closing up but encapsulating radioactive ions, in this case sodium and potassium. So here are the channels. So now if you grind the sample up and you put it over your sucrose density gradient, put everything in here, and then you spin it under high speed, then we have some material in the pellet, as we said, some that might float on the 20%, and then this is the 10% layer where we would get our microsacs now filled with radioactive sodium and potassium ions, and then free sodium and potassium ions, that is stuff that wasn't taken up by the microsacs, are going to be in this supernatant. They're, going to, they're light, they're going to be dissolved in the buffer, and they're going to stay up here in the supernatant even after high-speed centrifugation. So you're going to have uh, loose ions in the supernatant, and then you're going to have radioactive ions loaded inside the microsacs. So we have our microsacs now like this. We have radioactive sodium ions and potassium ions inside the microsacs. And we can detect, you know, with a, a detector, we can detect the level of radioactivity in this sample, in the microsac sample. And then Cheng Zhu decided to add to his sample of loaded microsacs now, radioactivity inside. And we've measured the level of radioactivity. Now if you add acetylcholine and the acetylcholine binds to the receptor, then Theoretically, it should liberate the radioactive ions, and they should move from the inside of the microsac to the outside of the microsac. And now, if you re-spin these experimental microsacs where acetylcholine has been added, 50%, 20%, 10%, the microsacs would again float on the 10% or the 20% in the 10% layer but floating on the 20% layer and free ions, radioactive ions, would now end up 
in the supernatant, and if we measured the radioactivity in this sample, it would be very low, or maybe zero. So these are loaded with a high level of radioactivity, and then after adding acetylcholine, um, the radioactivity leaves the microsacs and ends up in the supernatant. So, Shengzhu knew that these microsacs must contain the acetylcholine receptor and that it's functional. 